The storyteller is here. Morning. Is that the right... Right, I'm going to call you the storyteller. Cause you, you call, call me a storyteller, yes. Because you, you started out on the drama show. I did, I did, yes, I did. Uh, more years ago than I care to mention. Probably ten years ago, I think, we started. And then I left. I bunked off at the time, just before COVID. Um, uh, and we now live in deep south France, down in the Ariège, with the bears. Um, so it's the only bit of Europe that actually has... They're not... They were reintroduced in about... 25 years ago and, they, and and half the farmers still hate them but it still has a, but it has now quite a large bear population which is great yeah i think that's a good uh, yeah, up a good in the mountains thing. it's one of the it's got one of the last bits of wild forest in western europe so one of the last bits of the old forest that wasn't cut down so it's kind of like the western end of dartmoor if you know that at all that's kind of a little local rainforest um but the area is like that for 40 to 50 miles so it has its totally its own climate that's created by the wood Anyway, last uh, stop. I'll stop plugging the Ariège. Oh no, you can plug that because that's that is interesting. Mm. Where you are? Yeah, because uh, you, you were you were living in a van more or less. We were living in a van for two years. That's right. Um, and just two. Pre my uh, partner, who's a storytelling partner and everything else, uh, she's in a wheelchair. So living in a van in the Pyrenees for two through through two Pyrenean winters uh, was a bit of a mistake, actually. Uh, we, we probably shouldn't have done that. It was a little bit hard, too hard because it's kind of minus... Ooh, it'll go down to minus six as soon as look at you. Um, and uh, the other annoying thing about the Pyrenees is winter starts in March and ends in May. Uh, so you, you get through to February and think, oh, we haven't had a winter. And then all of a sudden it bloody snows and then it stays snowed for two months. Um, so that happened twice. And we never quite got used to it. But we now actually, finally, finally, in record time for the, for the area, because nobody likes to work, we've managed to build a house. It's not true that nobody likes to work. But the Ocotan is not Northern Europe. It doesn't quite have the same work ethic. So uh, things, uh, house projects in the Ocotan, they can in England, but in the Ocotan they can go on for 20 to 30 years and think, nobody ever finishes anything. I think it's... Could you turn the microphone round about 90 degrees? That, that's it. That's oh, okay, sorry. These are new mics. Um, yeah. Uh, they're, and they're, I'm still getting used to them. They're very directional. Okay. Yeah. You, right, you sorry about that. sort of fading in and out a little bit. Sorry. It's also but because I jump around on, on the mic and, and shout and hope that does the trick, but it, sometimes it doesn't. So have you got microphones in the Pyrenees? Have I got microphones in the Pyrenees? I have my old father's um, a setup which these days are not acceptable modern mics, which is why you haven't, why I haven't been sending you stories, Will. Oh. Uh, it's not that I don't have recording equipment. Well, it's not, I can record them. I can create MP3s and MP4s. I did experiment, but it wasn't... It's also that um, my big old computer got infected with a virus and I haven't been asked to get around to um, getting <laughs> the virus off. Uh -huh. Which is the other reason. Um, and, building a, and getting the house sorted took all our energy because you have to kind of pep the workforce to f do anything well yeah no i understand that yeah but anyway it took two years but we're done well mostly. that's brilliant but yeah. in print in principle you could you could record mp3 and it could find its way to uh, 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 in there is no particular reason if I could get the sound quality up to broadcast, we couldn't do that. Absolutely. Um, I did experiment, as I said, and it just wasn't quite broadcast quality. Um, so I would need to... Uh, somewhere I do have... A, a, I'd probably have the kit, but I have to get the virus off the computer. Um, and it's one of those jobs you sit there going... God, that's an entire morning checking on the internet how to get this wretched virus that just slows every. Well, the virus is sitting there slowing everything down. Of oh, and you. Oh, so anyway, so that's yes. what hasn't been yeah. done. No, I can understand that. Um, no, but it's 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 just good to know in principle that that's that's possible. Because mm. um, the time the time doesn't doesn't really matter. No, we're we're an hour ahead. But that's matter. Yes, but I mean, if it, if if you do a story and it it it, it you put a. a a USB stick in the post or something. It and doesn't we, matter. And we play it a few yeah. weeks later. Yeah, I could probably upload it. Uh, well, oh, I, oh yeah, well yes. I mean, I that, can that wind up the possible. internet. The, 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 I can wind up the internet and we can upload it. It probably does it. Um, yeah, probably does. It can be a little slow, but it, it does do it. Yeah, so we could download an MP3 file over, over a period yeah. of time. Yeah. Well, that's 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 good. Anyway, look, let's let's m move on. What what I think we'll, we'll is 
we'll do sort of follows what we've spoken about is that I'll go through the the topics I've got in mind, and it, we won't stop for a story during that. But if if a story comes to mind, you could tell some stories after afterwards. Sure thing, absolutely. And see 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 how that that works. Um, so, I'd, and I'll remind you of things because the may, well there will be new listeners. Uh, sure, you haven't heard because we we you you were here last summer. I was here last summer. That's right, telling depressing stories. Yeah, um, but the some people may have forgotten where where we, where we got to before. So and so I think um, a lot of this is going to revolve around universities and learning uh, how the how those institutions are structured and what can be said about that and where things might go. Um, and your own uh, history c working with such places may may come up as we go <laughs> along, but it's in, it's in the background anyway. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I I I've I, this is one of the reasons I got into drama or fiction because it, because I've I've found reality uh, frustrating in different different ways, which might might be quite general. That might be a general reason why people get into drama. Yeah, yeah. It certainly, it's where you get into fantasy. It makes more sense somehow. Yes, yes. That that's that follows on. Mm. So, about ten years ago, when the MOOC started, or people started to realise that learning through the interwebby was possible, um, there was a certain resistance to that. And um, for for example. Um, when Peter Horrocks started putting serious money from the Open University into FutureLearn, there was there was a lot of criticism uh, from Open University staff and and others. And on on one level, you can understand that because the the Open University is not the richest um, endowment orientated <laughs> uh, brand in the UK. It was it was a bit surprising that they were the ones who were funding FutureLearn. Although they were the ones who are the experts on doing that sort of thing. Well, yes, but there's... Um, and, and kind of, out. we've got a friend who teaches in the Open University, and one of the things he likes about it is that ability to do outreach. So that ability to kind of being able to reach to all different people in all different times, and, all different, and, people, and having people doing the courses from all different times of their lives. Um, and he teaches 19th century histo history, so it's quite a niche subject. Um, but he gets all kinds of people into the w origins of the Industrial Revolution, which was used to be his speciality. Um, and says one of the, well, this is a great thing about the OU, is that, that ability to experiment, because actually there's a, there's a side of it, because they don't have buildings, and everybody thinks they know what the OU is, it allows it to be quite experimental. Yes, but if, if, if it's um, a unicorn or a start-up, or something like that in interwebby terms. Um, it's quite risky. They uh, they might have lost fifty or a hundred million. They might have done. Uh, but if they didn't, but I mean, the, the gamble would have been that it was going to happen because it's somebody, somebody. The trouble with the, with with all, with internet company with internet things like that is that sooner or later they are going to happen. Somebody is going to work out how to do it. If you want, we'll come on to online teaching and maybe in a bit because I'm very ambivalent about it at the moment. Um, so, uh, but sooner or later, but somebody is going to eventually solve a good way of doing it. Sure. Um, uh, and the OU needs to kind of be a part of it because if they don't do it or they're not part of it, that somebody will have parked their tanks on the OU's particular lawn, much more than other universities, because other universities can sell the experience, whatever quite that means. Uh, but the OU has to sell being the OU and being easy and having the access and having people kind of so it can sell its literature because it produces severely good books. And uh, the fact it's got some very good lecturers on telly, but that probably wouldn't be enough to survive against an Internet Academy if any if somebody defined one that worked. So I'm not personally that surprised that any any OU uh, mm, president or whatever who was worth their salt would be wanting to at least have a toe in the water and experiment quite a lot. Anyway, so they started the MOOC. I they didn't know that. The, the, yeah, they start. Well, they started Future, Future Learn. Okay. Um, which was one of the one of the platforms, or is one of the platforms. Okay. Um, but, 
and the other reason of course they did that was they had the lecturers who had the expertise at lecturing to an audience that weren't there because uh, all my friends um doing uh, who work in universities um during covid they all had to learn how to do that so they all had to learn how to produce yes. powerpoint presentations and lecture when there isn't an audience because one of the things you do if you're lecturing in a lecture hall is bounce off the audience if they're not there it's difficult my, my impri- let, let's just gossip for a moment or two okay. and speculate um i think during lockdown that sort of thing happened on on uk university sites quite a lot yeah and it was all improvised yeah there wasn't any um handbook on how to do it or or a department to advise you or equipment and you know like, and like green work, screens or, and people work very hard to do it as well surely i'm not i'm not just i'm not i'm not in i'm, I'm not in any doubt about the fact that, that, that for the for the staff for the people who were having to lecture yeah. uh it it was a demanding situation and they put a lot of energy into it um but it was all improvised yep and it's quite wrong to judge the results of that as if it was a considered project in the sort of way future learn is capable of or mm. that peter horrocks was intending absolutely absolutely and, I, but, and it kind of i don't know again this is just talking to my friends in higher education they thought that so they put a lot of work in um and then they also thought it changed the way the students thought about lectures so um, all my friends have problems with people turning up to lectures people the students don't much anymore because they assume that they can just download it on the internet on the interweb and just look it up right and so that means you don't need to get up at nine o'clock and go to a philosophy lecture um or whatever but con- contrasting with that my, my impression is that the um the management the the people in charge of the universities believe it's all gone back to normal yeah well there's no philosophy yeah there's an awful i don't know what anybody else thinks but i think covid is this very strange thing it kind of lies on everybody's consciousness there's the year the years of lockdown and it keeps on kind of cropping up and it crops up in conversations about what people did and actually it changed an awful lot but we have we're not really very good at understanding what it has changed and some things it hasn't if you're a teacher some things it's clearly changed for the worst so students are actually much harder to reach these days than they used to be before covid i mean i mean in terms of teaching actually getting them to people to think and to do things and to do presentations is genuinely harder because they had two years after their education that weren't there um, and I know they were at home and doing home learning and everybody did their best and the teachers did wonderfully or they, uh, but, but still they didn't have the support and that will be something that lies across education um, for a very, very long time uh, and in order to disguise that fact because actually that's difficult um, the, high, the, the top brass of all education establishments will try to ignore it and they will just fail these students and say oh, well, our students have got worse or whatever um, because that's what they do um or more realistically they, they'll try to ignore it and just rig the grades and stop and uh although the students have got worse to hide that fact as well because they tend to brush things under the, i'm very skeptical about well, top brush universities they've got worse but... they've got they've got less accepting of a, of a traditional lecture based <laughs> approach no well i'm so, 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 so i'm just push push the I, question, I, question a little I, no, bit. no 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 I was, is, yeah, is, I, the, is there a more hybrid method that the, the teaching could Adopt, maybe which would make more sense. maybe i was being rude about the students i'm afraid um uh so my my knowledge here is is limited to about four or five friends who still te- lecture in academia okay and one of the things they say about this about the people the, the kids that they lecture who were uh, did a levels in covid and of course it's not all of them and of course my knowledge base is philosophy so it's very very limited to a very particular set of knowledge bases is that uh, first of all, students, and it's also linked to something else. It's linked to the fact that if you're paying an arm and a leg and a, a stomach to do a you know, to do a degree, you tend to assume that you ought to pass it. Oh yes. Uh, and so the wiggle room for my academic friends to kind of fail—they uh, fail more than they have ever failed before. They said. Um, and that's not just that was also in nursing and they were failing more people because the students were assuming that they had to pass because they had paid all that money 
And it was a sea change. It was something to do with COVID, something to do with the lockdown, something to do with the way the government was fleecing students. Am I allowed to say that, Alphonic? Uh, well, yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah, I think so. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, that's not... Um... It's not, not too political. It's also just truthful. Um, so once you start charging students huge amounts of money to go on courses, uh, the students expect to pass those courses. And that plus... Uh, COVID has hugely changed the kind of the attitude that students have to being on the courses in a way that really, really gets to my uh, academic friends because they say the students aren't very, they're not very used to reading. So trying to get, keep kids to read is very, very hard. It was always hard, but it's, they, they, they almost have given up now. Um, they expect to be able to pass, which sometimes that doesn't quite happen. Um, it's also made more fun because the academia, uh, uh, because the government has been, well, it's more complicated than just the government. I, I won't go into the full well, politics the, the, of it. The, no, but, they, but, but the, the, the academics the, have been on the, strike, so they haven't might be marking. Well, yeah, that's, there's those, those, those problems. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's any secret that the, the, the government have a lot of um, pr critiques of their own uh, aimed at academics and the politics of it, and they, they, they don't necessarily think that a lot of students on a lot of social science courses is, is good for the Conservative Party. I think we can say that because that's clearly the that's case. That's clearly, clearly the case, yeah. Yes, it's clearly so there's, the case. So there's a lot of difficulties in there that are a lot. Of, there are a lot of difficulties. They don't really like people doing critical thought for the obvious reason. It might make them critical. Well, it might. It might do, yes. Again, it might, it might, 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 might make them realise that... I, I shall say, uh, and then I think that's a fairly balanced approach. But no, I think you should just... I, will, can we can I, also, think, I can I also point... Oh, well, just because I but it might make you understand that if the planet warms up by two degrees, we're so screwed. And we're currently on schedule to warm, warm up by about 4.5 okay. degrees well, by 2050. Well, um, <laughs> yes. I'm, go I'm going to say, can we come back to that later? Oh, okay, sure thing. Because um, when uh, Peter Horrocks went to Durham University... I uh, ran about ten years ago. He gave he gave a talk about the Fortress University, um, which is, uh, uh, l let's say, the Russell Group of universities, and how the internet would break that down, and his ambitions for future learn and the the whole MOOC uh, project, as it was then, fa fairly new. But he he definitely saw it all as a challenge to this idea of, of three-year courses with a student experience on a campus and um, an alternative of, of li lifelong learning and um, a much more accessible setup. Um, but I, do, I don't think that there was much follow-up on, on that. And now uh, Durham University have made that unlisted. You can't, you can't directly link to that talk. Oh, that's great. I love that. It must have been a very good talk. <laughs> it's an excellent talk. <laughs> um, you can always tell it's good when it gets suppressed. That's brilliant. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary to my mind that, that they... Because I've tried to get permission to use clips out of it, which is not possible. Um, the Open University press release is still online. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can gather from that what was said, and they have a, a PDF of the text. But you can't get the the video at this time you, you it's it, if you can, if you can get a direct link to it you can find it yeah but that is to my mind it's totally weird that Durham well, would, would no, leave it like that uh, well if you imagine that they've just invested have a million in big Brussels universities are investing to cut city centers and build student accommodation uh you would have uh, they need to protect their investment uh, there's the pension funds of Britain probably depend upon it um which is probably true because I would have assumed that large pension funds are invested in large and building organisations, um, stripping out the city centres even as we speak. Well, yes. <laughs> for for listeners outside Exeter, we're talking about. Um, we're not. We're 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 in general terms, but also well, about yes, Exeter. Yes, I'll just mention that we Harlequins, which is a, a a shopping mall in in the middle of Exeter, uh, which isn't viable as a shopping mall is thought to be viable were it demolished and replaced with student accommodation. Mm. Uh, again, uh, those of us who have long memories next to will remember about 30 years ago, Harlequins was a really wonderful little thriving alternative shopping centre. It's possible the footfall's changed, but it's also possible that they up the rents too much. But I shall... That's probably a different story. Yes. Uh, anyway, 
what I what I what I worked out as a a, a, a fantasy, as you mentioned a, a, earlier on, fantasies do make sense to people. Um, was to, to to use the ruins of Kendal, which is not not far from Durham, in, as things go. Um, but the co the castle there is definitely a ruin, and so lends itself to a sci-fi future, in which the the campus fortress model has been replaced by something else but the the campus is still there or the base is still there and uh, I, I thought that you as the stand-up philosopher because this is one of your one of my old shows yeah yes personas let's say um, would g offer an address a, sta a, a stand-up routine let's say for a 40 minute um, reflection on what happened to the fortress university how it all became a ruin, and uh, what what was the university about anyway? And you so far you've said, oh yes, yes, yeah, I could, yeah. you could do that. I could do that. I certainly can. It will be in Lake District probably next year. So yeah, yeah, I can do that. Um, and the future of higher education is is clearly hugely complicated because there's very big money involved um, on all sides. Um, and that kind of is driving something that is not really appropriate for educate for what it claims to be. So education claims to be all about educating people, including the name, but most of it isn't. Um, and and it, I mean, it isn't in secondary school, but in, in, in on the tertiary sector, on the university sector, uh, it, I think it's becoming seriously deranged because there is serious, serious capital investment um, stripping out city centres at a time when you're going really isn't that appropriate and then the and then the other thing universities do is what they need to sell is really good lectures and universities don't always not all universities but universities don't always give very good lectures and they don't always give very good teaching so they're taking a lot of money they're spending a lot of money but what they're meant to be providing is not always that good if you want my honest opinion with teaching so if you're talking i mean i can give well, again if, you, if i mean i'll just go back to the to to, to the point we made made earlier which which might might be right i mean it would be interesting if stu students who hear this w would would comment on it sometime but it it may be that the th what's provided needs to be in, s in a different format yes that's right it needs to be rethought through certainly if you are going to design a t and I'm, I'm absolutely not knocking st uh, mo a lot of lecturers by the way i think a lot of lecturers are wonderful um and i've got a lot of very good friends well, some of my best friends are lecturers which is actually true um i actually have a lot of i have a lot of respect for them and they're being sh really really put a lot of pressure on by academia who expects them to be full-time teachers full-time researchers and full-time admin um so don't worry about a private life because you ain't gonna have time for that and don't worry about making much money either because you're not going to do that so the academics are under huge and, amounts and, of pressure and, which doesn't and, help and also they're expected to study artificial intelligence technology development oh yeah oh, and, and I, work out how they as a as a personal I, project could improvise when required that's right so so i'm i'm absolutely not knocking academics i'm knocking the uh the idea that we have of institutions as some sort of initiation right where people go and leave home into these student accommodations and then are allegedly studying something that isn't being presented in a way that's doable by the poor old academic uh, teaching staff because they've got too many pressures coming on from top brass who have got serious money invested in this uh, and the entire thing is seriously is deranged in the sense that it isn't doing what it says it ought to be doing and if you were if you were seriously thinking, let's educate about, I'm going to make up a figure now, 10% of the population in philosophy, which is roughly about what we're doing, or in liberal arts, um, how would we do it? You certainly wouldn't do it this way. I mean, uh, the OU would be a much better model for that sort of a thing. And it, discussion groups, um, and I'm a great fan of face-to-face -face discussion groups, but they can be done very, very cheaply. You can do them in the back of a room. You don't need huge, multi-big invest uh, big investments. And then you allow academics to teach, because most academics would delight in teaching and research, but in a slightly more informal environment, because you need to take the big money out of education, out of tertiary education, because at the moment it's a big money sector. I mean, I don't know, uh, and I genuinely don't know, so I'm now making it up, making up alert, but I would assume that traditionally, and I know it has recently changed, uh, Britain hugely sells its universities across the world, and it is a major um, 
It is a major wager, a major earner of foreign currency in Britain. Yeah, uh, I think that's true. And and that is really what is driving the driving the entire thing. So the principals are looking at it going, we need to keep this going. We need to keep this cash cow coming. We need to keep the money coming from abroad. It's becoming difficult. Um, and that is how they're understanding what a university is, um, which is the word utter travesty probably doesn't quite cover it um, because they're not that uh, they're assuming that the students will come if they just provide the environment. Who, who cares about the teaching and the courses? That doesn't matter. They'll come anyway. Will they? Um, well, yeah, they, 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 it's the research profile. They, they believe the research profile is what determines it. And the, the, the students are probably very bright anyway, and they'll, they'll learn. So the, the teaching environment or learning environment is, is not the priority. But absolutely. But then, of course, they don't really give the academics t space to teach either, uh, to do proper research either. Or at least I don't think they do. They give them sabbat they get sabbaticals, and academics do get sabbaticals to do research. But there's so much pressure on them; it becomes very hard to do the research. At least that's what my friends say. They 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 having problems, literally finding the time to produce stuff. Where bef five years ago they had lots of time. Well, we we welcome other people to comment, but the, I I can't disagree with you at the moment. Is it, you, what you're saying seems quite plausible. I just go going through my notes. I just sort of because there's a, there's other ways of um, looking at these same questions, but you've you, you've 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 covered a lot of this this uh, material anyway as it happens. But I'll just just mention that um, I I did ask you to be part of a a um, proposal for the Today program. I did, but I wasn't quite sure what was going on there. Well, no, I, 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 I lost the plot of that. Yes. <laughs> well, that's fair enough, um, because it was, it was very vague, and my own ideas about it were very vague. Um, essentially, I think, uh, in August, not only are all the members of Parliament on holiday, but the, the kind of people who hang out in London and might be an alternative, they're also on holiday. And so they, they're going to offer the guest editing role uh, to any of the listeners who who would like a go at it, um, but you have to be a group, and that's that's where I I find it complicated because um, I I spoke to to people on the Wild Show and the We Not Know Show and uh, yourselves, and um, I filled in the form, but I didn't fill in all the inf there's lots of information they they seem to want, which I I left out, um, but and I I so. Uh, so I put forward my own ideas and then modified it depend, depending on the feedback to make it a bit more groupy. But since they haven't come back to me, I'm, I'm just going to go on with my own ideas and then see what, um, what sense it makes to other people. Um, but I really wanted to get into this, this situation that you've f described already very well. Um, why is it assumed that the, the model that existed before COVID uh, will just come back mm. um, so that the investment in the campus and as you say the student accommodation in, in quite expensive locations you would think um, is just be continuing there's no, yeah. there's, no, there's no modification of that model No. so in terms of a today programme what I would do is have the 6.15 business break. I, I don't know if you've listened to a Today programme all the way through. Only in my wildness nightmares. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, I, I do occasionally. Not, I don't listen to it all the way through, but I have listened to it and does, the, does the, And the radio survives the experience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I throw things at it occasionally, but, um, but essentially you've got a 6.15 business slot and a 7.15 business slot. And then some bigwig will arrive soon after eight because they, they don't get up that early, you'd imagine, mm. or the audience is, is thought to be higher at, yeah. at, by eight o'clock. So um, on my module, 6.15, look at um, office space in London. And you could actually go out and do an outside broadcast, not far away from Broadcasting House. But you'd, you'd have somebody saying, well, um, since... Covid and the lockdown, um, people l use a lot less space, mm. and you've got HSBC moving out of Canary Wharf mm. into about sixty percent of the space they first thought of, for example. 
Um, it's just damaging. People discover they don't need all the swag and don't need to spend all the money. It's very damaging. Well, it changes things, doesn't it? You would think. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it means that real estate becomes less lucrative, which is very damaging. Which is, if you're a party that represents real estate, it's a worrying thing. Well, you, we're going back to possible controversy. I haven't and said which party. Well, well I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite prepared to say that the, the, the Conservative Party. Um, has quite a lot of support from the construction industry. I think that's. I think that's. I would have thought on, that was. On, I would have thought that was reasonable. Macalpine and etc. Um, and also, weirdly, the what's his name? Michael Michael Gove. He's the minister for levelling up. <laughs> and according to is that what he calls it? <laughs> according 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 to the newspapers. According to the newspapers, as I remember, I, I haven't brought them with me, but I think I could find the reference for this later on um, an amazingly large number of, of houses in Cambridge will transform the UK into another Silicon Valley and therefore it's, it's the building of the houses that's going to make the difference and this, this the, how this relates to levelling up to the rest of the country I'm not sure is in Cambridge one of the wealthiest areas in the country it said it's got the highest property um, but we, well, yeah. Look, all, all, all I'm all I'm doing is repeating the newspapers. But yeah, yeah, let, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's move on because uh, that's okay. Quarter past six. Then quarter past seven. Uh, look at shopping. Um, so somebody else would just talk about what has happened to retail space, required retail space, which is when I want them to go and look at where the Virgin Mega Store used to be. Um, where Tower Records used to be, so that's New Oxford Street, Piccadilly Circus. But um, what what has happened since I came up with this fantasy is that actually HMV is coming back. So I don't know when it's coming back, but HMV will be returning to Oxford Street. Okay. So here's, it's quite a a complicated here's a trivial fact picture. for you from, from another life. One of the reasons the uh, the BBC, not just the BBC, one of the reasons I think the media report France is dangerous, full of riots, is because France is dangerous, but for another reason. I'll give you the dangerous fact from France. There are now more small bookshops in France this year than there were last year, and the numbers are going up and up and up. Now, there are two reasons for that. First of all, the French don't like Amazon, which is reasonable. Um, if, if you don't know why you shouldn't like Amazon, just go and Google them. And the second reason is that the French never abolished the standard book price. So that all books in France cost the same. So that means you can't have the big discounters, which means that they can actually still have small bookshops doing all kinds of different books. So that means there's a vibrant French small publishing industry. I mean, the way there isn't in Britain. Um, because... They didn't. So you know what I mean by the, the the retail price. Just to remind everybody, it used to be the case that the price of books was fixed, so that you weren't allowed to discount a book. And the British abolished it. I think that was John Major. Was that John Major? You might know. You're in publishing, Bill. You might know um, that. It, yeah, I think you're probably right. But we'll, we'll look it up. We will check this. Later. That, I think it was John Major. Uh, so he abolished the uh, price that books were allowed to be the the, the minimum price of books. And that meant that the supermarkets started to discount books. And that closed, before Amazon finished them off, it closed a lot of small bookshops. They went straight away, almost overnight, within two to three years. And then Amazon finished off the big guys as well, which actually, back in the day, about t t uh, 15 years ago, just felt like poetic justice to me. Uh, <laughs> but none of that story happened uh, in France. It's why it's all so dangerous, because they do capitalism rather differently. Um, there is an absolute assumption in france that absolutely everybody has a right to good food and happiness and that's so and and one of the reasons they riot is because uh, if anybody queries that and says no you should work uh that's an immediate riot because they assume that got, they're, they're allowed to eat well and be happy uh which actually strikes me as not a, such a very bad idea but it's of course terribly terribly dangerous uh which is why france is said to be burning anyway that's a slightly different issue um but but what it what it means is that because I I don't think it's just in France I think there are small bookshops uh, coming in in the in the UK there are but the they and and but they're growing but, so in France they're growing quite rapidly because people are go aren't are are not doing Amazon and they I mean I'm sure that they are to a degree in Britain uh, but in our town we live in a relatively small area in very very rural France. Um, 
and we have two amazingly good bookshops and you sit there going how on earth does a small rural community if you think uh, the smallest rural town you can think of in Devon and make it slightly smaller, that's Saint-Jean, uh, and give it a slight drug problem as well. And yet it supports two very good bookshops. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. So, so Oxford Street could, could be... I, I mean, it's not, it's not um, empty. No, it's, it's not empty. There's not a lot of empty shops on Oxford Street, but it could, it could be doing even better. It could be doing even better. Well, I don't know. That I, I don't know. I've got much hope for Oxford Street. It's going to have very high rents come what may, isn't it? Well, yeah, you would think. Yeah, but you could certainly. Uh, there used to be uh, somewhere like Soho before it became a porn area. Used to have lots of little second-hand bookshops. Do you remember that? Yes. Back in the day, I'm just about old enough to remember endless little bookshops in bits and bobs all over London, uh, which have since long gone. Um, and that was not just the uh, abolishing of the retail book price, but it certainly finished off an awful lot of little, little bookshops because they just couldn't compete. And there's nothing like a little bookshop because you get all kinds of... I used to have a lovely... When we first moved to Exeter, uh, down in Topsham, there was a Topsham Books, and he had a database of all the books available in English print. And uh, uh, we, I would go in and order the most obscure philosophy books you could possibly find, and he would get it for me, and it would be the same price as if I had bought it anywhere else because it was just bef- as they were... Be- it must have been just after they abolished the retail price. Uh but they still didn't discount and nobody discounts philosophy books anyway but there were the, and it was just wonderful because you could just go in and you could order now you could say well i could do that on amazon and you could but you wouldn't have the fun and then uh, no. and then you wouldn't see other things as well because as, as he was looking them all up he would find you other little books and suggest them to you and it was great so anyway uh, after those two business bits which are just based on what's happening with office space and retail um round about 10 past eight find the best person available to say um, I'm from a UK university and we know what's going on and um, we, we saw what happened during lockdown and uh, this is this is what we're doing yes yes you're, yes uh, you might need to give them anonymity well, okay. <laughs> that's all I can say <laughs> disguise their voices <laughs> Well, anyway, that that's that was my proposal for a today program, and uh, we'll see what happens in August. Um, but you 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 came back saying it should be uh, about results because because it was going to be in August. You wanted yeah. it to be about well, the results, the, the, the way the results, the way exam and results, that, and what that meant. Yes, well, I'm always interested in results and how they're played with different gov- um One of the. Um, so back in the day when I was in the GCSE, I used to take a private math tutor for GCSE, and I also do it a little bit in France. And one of the things you're very aware of is the things like math GCSE, which everybody has to do, is a huge cultural artefact. So you get to learn about how a society thinks it ought to select people from the way they create maths exams. So the contrast is France. Uh, in France, uh, having taught, I'm, my experience, teaching experience in France is limited, but I do have some. Um, and it feels to me that the entire system is designed to give everybody a number. So everybody in France knows the grade they got in their final set of exams. And you can ask somebody at the age of 70 and they'll know. Um, because it, and that number is what defines what they can do for the rest of their lives. So it's a sorting system. Now, that does not mean it's an education system. Let's be very, very clear about that. If you wanted to actually teach kids maths, you wouldn't teach them. And it's the same in Britain. Uh, It's not quite the same in Britain. I'll come back to that. Um, But uh, in France, if you wanted to teach kids maths so that they understood maths, you wouldn't teach it the way it's presented in in, in the syllabus. It's not a design to get kids learning. It's designed to sort them out. And say those ones, are, those ones have passed. Those ones have failed. Those ones will give that grade. Those ones will give that grade. Those ones give that grade. Oh, there's a high natural wastage, but who cares? Um, which is true. Um, and that tells you a little bit of kind of about the way French society can work, which is that it, although there is the lovely anarchy side and everybody has a right to happiness, there is also a side where it's quite hierarchical and everybody gets sorted quite quickly. Um, the British system is quite a contrast because I always have thought, and I taught in Britain for God's teeth. 25, 20, nearly 30 years, uh, off and on. And um, 
the British maths exam had two incarnations. One incarnation, it actually tried to teach kids maths. And there were very brief periods in my teaching career between about 2000 and... Uh, they, they reformed the exam from about 2012, and then uh, Gove got rid of it in 2016. So for four years, we were teaching maths that allowed you to actually function in life, like work out your tax bill um, and work out how much money the government was wasting so of course they abolished that so there is a, a a trope there is a genre of the maths uh in in maths education where they actually tried to teach kids maths in england and that's hugely to be if any political party uh, wants to change the maths exam back to that vote for them um or the entire system uh the gove reforms in, in 2016 meant that it was um in order to be able to pass maths GCSE, you need to be in relatively small classes because it's a nasty technical math exam which requires a lot of input by the teacher to get kids through it. Um, so I wonder which schools have small classes, Will. If you have a class of over 30, it's very hard to pass current maths GCSE and it's designed for that. So it's designed for schools with small classes. I'll let you all work out which ones I mean uh, to get better results um, so that we're selecting on class. Um, and you can tell a lot about a society, about the way they structure their maths exams. Uh, German maths exams are quite funny because what they're designed to do is to winnow off about 30% of the population who they educate very highly and the others go off to voc vocational uh, training. And they have a maths exam at 12, that's a kind of a sheep and a goats, and it naturalises that. And if you get on the wrong one, heaven help you. <laughs> um, so we got, back in France, we got some really good German friends and. Uh, they're very aware that they were part of the 30% intelligentsia. And you sit there going, wow. <laughs> if you're British um, and you're brought up in this ethic, uh, when the British system works, by the way, I actually think it's the best in the world and I'm not very patriotic, so you know I really mean that. Um, and I genuinely do. It's the best I've ever found because it doesn't do any of that and it doesn't like wasting people. <laughs> but most other systems are designed to simply to separate the sheep and the goats and to take the rulers off and put them in a nice little elite establishment because they haven't got the class system and they haven't got royalty, so that, which is how we select. So they, they need to have another way of doing it and they use maths to do it. Um, anyway. I've probably well, gone totally off topic now, no, well, not, not at all. but all not of that all. endlessly no. fascinates me on that issue of results. So comparing well, the way... Yeah, yes, but if, if, the, if the Today programme or any, anybody else is looking for a topic in August, which not, n there is no news... There um, is, well, there's only one thing that's news, and that's the results. And to genuinely look at what results mean is a really... It, the trouble is, do it properly, it is too political. And again, it gets called these days is with universities in particular, but and it's going to filter down to A level. It gets caught up with big money because results uh, are for universities, but also for schools. Results is money. You need to, uh, if you don't get good results, uh, people get to know that you're not very good. See what I mean? Yes. And and everything gets tied up to it. And in universities where you have a problem where they're fleecing students, the students then expect to part. I've got. A, we do Glastonbury with a friend who teaches in one of the big nursing colleges and he says it's frankly terrifying these days because the nurses because they're not given bursaries they have, they have to pay a lot of money to do a nursing course and that means nobody's really allowed to fail and it absolutely doesn't matter if they don't speak English um, so he's having to pass people who he thinks would fail an English exam so uh, they can't and they're going off to be hospital nurses without being able to understand spoken English. And that's quite scary, actually, because it affects treatment. It affects how you relate to people. But they expect to pass because they've paid God knows how many thousands. Well, yes, and, and, and the, you, you can think of an alternative situation in which the government... Properly would, funded would, nursing. Yeah, and, and t training and education. I do know when that was abolished. That was 2016. They got rid of the nursing bursary. It used to be the case that nursing uh, was paid for because obviously the country needs good nurses. So you would have. Well, yes, that's that's. It's one of the, they didn't do that in France. I'll have uh, uh, I've, both me and my wife. We spent far too long in French hospitals, uh, but French hospitals are a revelation you, um, because they pay money for not just actual nursing, but they pay money for the auxiliary nurses. So the auxiliary nurses, who are the ones who do all the care, actually care are actually care about you. So my wife, when she she broke her arm. 
Uh, she's got MS, so she falls over regularly because we live eventful lives. Uh, and she had a particularly bad fall back in October and broke her... Now, she broke her arm up near the elbow. And so she was in a French hospital for a, a week. And they were so worried that she wasn't moving enough, they came and gave her a reflexology. So they came and gave her long foot rubs because in order to stimulate the blood... Uh, in Britain, you'll get a support stocking if you're lucky, but that's because the French subs uh, actually fund the auxiliary nursing, so they fund the caring bit of the nursing. Um, because and they have a bursary, they they pay for nurses to do qualifications, uh, uh, to to get through the qualifications. We don't in Britain. No. And it's just you go. It's just elementary. If you want people to do a job that involves caring, um, pay for them. Well, that would make perfect sense. Might up the tax rate hardly at all. I would have thought a bit. Well, uh, um, I'm not. I'm not trying to avoid that question, but I'd, I'd just like to move on to other to other, <laughs> other things. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's 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 the Today program sorted out. We'll see what what they do in August. Um, but what I, what I want to also talk about is is the the Gutenberg parenthesis. I'm not sure if you followed up on this. I tried tweeting to you. About, I think he, he might be a... It will assume that the audience haven't followed up on it as well, Will. <laughs> hide my modesty. <laughs> OK, well, I'll start, I'll start again then. The Gutenberg Parenthesis is a book that's coming out by Jeff Jarvis uh, uh, from a journalism point of view. It's, it's out in the States, it's out in the UK at the end of this month, I think. And it's, it's saying that print is like an interlude, that there was um, a... a and, and the printing insists on defined scope for quite authority-based views about a story or research or whatever it is that's described. Um, and you have so you have an authority figure, the author. Uh, but before print, you had uh, gossip. Let's say you had a lot, a lot more voice communication, and storytelling was much looser uh, there wasn't a strong idea of copyright so stories could be reinterpreted and, and developed as they went along and this is what we're coming back to with the internet uh, that the, the internet is getting away from the idea of a fixed text um, it's, it's not necessarily voice driven I think in the way that Jeff Jarvis describes it but I, I think perhaps it, it will become that because it, I, I also get the impression that, that voice is... Vo Say again? Uh, image driven. The internet is image driven. Driven by images. Memes. It's driven by images. Uh, I think it's image driven anyway. Don't you, do you think internet's image driven? So what drives the internet? Well, when something like TikTok... I don't do TikTok. I'm pretending to know something I know nothing about. So you can all say, Oh, he's never done it! I've never done it. Um, but my... My, um, uh, my people who have... I've told me it's little videos. Yes, yes. And and that means it, the thing is image and word for driven. It's but it's and you could call that. That's why he's calling it voice. But it's not really voice. It's image. It's about the image. It's about seeing somebody. Okay. It's about seeing somebody uh, cook a lasagna in a toilet or something like that. I was just saying that they did it. It's neither here nor there. You have to see it. Right. Okay. Um, and that changes it totally out of the. Oh well. No. Very big claim. Um, I don't know. That means you can compare it to what went before. So back in the day, back in the uh, back when half our stories, we, we uh, one of our performance names is Wizard and Dior, which are the two oldest poems in the English language. And so they're scalds, uh, they're the Anglo-Saxon kind of storytellers and gossip mongers who would travel from place to place. Um, Telling people stuff that was you limited so everybody could tell a story but the, not everybody was a storyteller and it was very wordy based um, because it was all about the words and all about the spoken word and I think the internet has a very different rhythm to that um, because first of all really anybody can make a meme um, it is very very image image um, image led so there's I mean, you can think about it this way. I have a spell check program that that doesn't seem to know the word here, as in I hear. It always changes it to H E R E. Now I'm dyslexic and can't be asked, so I never notice. But um, 
my point is that if you've got anything that's kind of wordy based, it would go wild with that. But actually, none of us care because it's all image based anyway. So. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. um, so I think I'm not sure I agree with him. I, I certainly agree with him that, uh, but that's not new. So that's uh, Roland Barthes in 19, oh God, 1970, I think it was, wrote a book about the death of the author which is very famous, in which he's quoting the death of God, of course. Um, so he, he, took, he, the, the, he took one of the effects of the death of God uh, would be the death of the author writing the book. Um, and that, that gave us all the right to endlessly re, re-understand and reinterpret books as, as we wanted to do so, which was the precursor to the Internet. And the Internet is kind of that written large. We take, we take, we take truth and we reinvent it however much we like. Um, <laughs> and invent conspiracy theories because there's the death of the author um and it was also i say it's image to belt so tiktok is image in there and the other thing it's led is kind of i suppose it's rumor led i suppose i'm thinking about conspiracy theories here but we probably ought to have an interlude or a bit of music before i start shooting my mouth off uh well i think i'm going to wrap up the the questions and and leave the best part of an hour for stories so I'll just I'll just carry on with a a, a, a couple more. Okay. So that, that's all right, and then play 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 sure play, play musical chat. Um, I'll 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 shift the the conversation a little bit. Riddles, because um, I know you you're aware of riddles from the Exeter book, mm. and I don't know quite what what date you'd put on those. But would would those would you think have existed just as speech before they were written down? Oh yeah. They never write down the answers, so who knows? Uh, they don't write down the answers. Uh, the extra book, um, first time it's recorded in history is when the bishopric moves from Crediton to Exeter, and then it's described as a big English, as a big book full of all sorts of English things. Um, and if none of you have ever seen it, it's in the Exeter Cathedral Library. I'm not sure about its access these days. There was a point where you could just go in and see it, but nobody did. So now I think you can't. And they can only show you a facsimile in the library from time to time. Um, but uh, if, it's, if you were living in a slightly different country, so France, um, you would have an entire theme um, museum based around the Exeter book because culturally it's more important than the Bayer Tapestry. Yes, I did say that. It is culturally more important than the Bayer Tapestry because it is the only work in all of English that has non all of old English so that's Anglo-Saxon English that's the precursor to English yeah you probably won't understand it it will sound like Frisian if you hear it but it's the language that becomes English and this is the only work in all the dark ages that has female poetry it has non-Christian poetry and it has some of the rudest and funniest riddles that you could possibly mention 600 of them um, uh, that and when it was written nobody knows um, sometime in the great flowering of Anglo-Saxon scholarship in the 10th century. So sometimes during the, the if anybody can uh, with long memories remember, I once did a history of England from about, I think I did it from 10, uh, 410, 410 to um, modern day, I think I did. And one of the things where we did an awful lot of stories about was Anglo-Saxon England, because I'm very interested in Anglo-Saxon England. But the flowering of, of the first flowering of English civilization was in the 900s, so from about from Alfred the Great and his great time of learning and his defeat of the Danes, which was 878, until the death of Edgar, which was 970. There was a hundred years where Britain was the top scholarship, uh, the place people went in all of Europe to learn uh, uh, for scholarship. Not necessarily biblical scholarship, but general scholarship. And the extra book is part of that. In some ways, it's the sole relic of this amazing uh, pre-conquest civilization of England. And it's in Exeter. It's one of the great cultural artifacts. And I think they, they had an artist in the cathedral really plugging it. So perhaps you're all now sick to the back teeth of the exit book and you go, oh, we all know about that. <laughs> but my God, it deserves it. It deserves a music. You should probably get rid of some of the student accommodation and turn it into a... Uh, get rid of I know what we should do with the Harlequins. We should, send, we should turn it into the extra book. Um... Visitor Centre. Center. And the other thing that you... So, j j just so... I've, I've, got, I've got another uh, one. I haven't quite... I just, no, just quick. Right. I, I'm, 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 I'm carrying on my plug for the Exeter Cathedral Library. Yes. There are two other great books in the Exeter Cathedral Library. There are three, actually. There's an original copy of Isaac de Kaus, which is how to build uh, robots made out of water pressure. 
in the 17th century. Literally, that is there in the in the because it's fairly rare because uh, it's an original. <laughs> um, uh, so they were uh, building theatres to present Shakespeare uh, by robot. It's kind of AI, but it's all water driven. It's what steam engines were you for. It's got a copy of Bale's Dictionary, but that's a minority sport. And but the other one that ought to be in our th- imaginary theme park. Uh, where we'll do lots of proper education because we should replace universities with um, uh, big, big, big educational theme parks. It says that there's an early draft of the Doomsday Book in the Exeter Cathedral Library, um, which was kind of the initial tax demands when the, when the Doomers did the tax returns. Um, they wrote, they wrote, they, they wrote, they presented a large number of these draft books that then gets pulled into the Doomsday Book. Okay, and only one of them survives. And that one is next to the Cathedral Library. So you it used to be the case you could go and see the Doomsday Book, a product actually of Anglo-Saxon scholarship, but ordered by the Conquest, next to the only work in all, uh, that survives from this amazing period of scholarship. So you kind of got the beginning and the end, the flowering and the ending of the scholarship, all in next to the Cathedral Library. I would have thought that was worth a theme park, wouldn't you, Will? Oh, I think it should be a theme park. I, I don't know how, how much time you've spent in Exeter, because I know you're moving about the UK. Uh, uh, oh, n- uh, this time, I'm afraid we're going back to France. We broke down uh, in the Limousin. Uh, if any of you know the France, you'll know that Limousin is quite poor. Uh, it's like breaking down in mid-Devon for a week. Uh, I've broken down in mid-Devon for a week. It was very similar, actually. Um, uh, the water pump of the van gave blew up, um, which was quite spectacular. So we were stuck in our little... Uh, we have a uh, stealth van, so it looks like a Citroen relay. Um, living, but anyway, that took a week of the week of when we were meant to be in Exeter, so we've only here till Monday. Well, if you go into the museum, the Ram on, yeah. on Queen Street, they've they've got a, a a show based on medieval manuscripts. Okay. Um, which used to be in Exeter, but they were they were given to Oxford, the Bodleian, I think. Some one of the Oxford Oxford Museum it, it, places. It would be the, it would be the Bodleian. They've got they 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 own them now. Okay. But they've graciously allowed Exeter to have them back again. Okay, what manuscripts are they? Oh, uh, now that you've got me there, I, d- I can't remember the details of it. Yeah. But I think well, if, that you, if you've got time... When, we've pulled, down, you, when we've pulled down the Harlequin and replaced it by a, a museum directly opposite the Ram, we yes. could even have a bridge going between them. You could. Um, we could create... We would, we would put them in there as well, because actually there's a big... The, that, that's interesting because it does mean that the it's very likely, isn't it? The scriptorium tradition in Exeter Cathedral continued, and the, uh, they kept the uh, records. Isn't that interesting? Well, I would have thought. Yeah, I think we've got to come back to all of this yeah. and get some get some dates dates together. Get some dates together because it must also be interesting. Because again, it goes back to education. Because back in the day where we started, there weren't that many books. Well, no. Just, just say again. How how much voice culture was going on at the at the when? Uh, well, from t- um, say a thousand to it was all voice. It was all uh, so. Uh, back in the day, when universities were invented, when they actually had a reason, um, that was because uh, there was a very limited number of books. Um, so there was Plato. There was the Bible. Um, there was a very limited amount of Aristotle up until about 1270. Um, and that was all there really was from the ancient world. Oh, and there was a lot of geometry. Um, so ancient, so the, uh, the master masons who built Exeter Cathedral under, uh, would have, uh, could have read Euclid because Euclid does survive. And that's one of the reasons that they can start, they think they're carrying on the experimentations of late antiquity because that survives. But there was all, <coughs> most of it was communicated by word of mouth. So most of it was you had one person who could read, um, who was the master, uh, and then you would they would they would then be training up people who could read. But a lot of the students couldn't read, um, and all the teaching was done by word of mouth. And that's why you had a lecture. Uh, the lecture was the one person who read the book because there was only one book, and everybody else was learning it. Um, and you did it in uh, spaces, uh, halls. And so the great universities grow out of that. They grow out of the lack of books. Um, and then they've lived through various incarnations. They've lived through a plethora of books and having lots of books. And now they're trying to reinvent themselves in an internet age. But there comes must come a point where you go, what's the point of them? 
uh, because back in the 12th century it was very clear they were training clergymen um, there was then the deep problem of Aquinas because what happens is this is ancient history and maybe it's not interesting to everybody but uh, uh, Aristotle says an awful lot of things that were very very difficult to reconcile with conventional Christianity okay and uh, uh, but he gets accepted as part of the canon so the church in about 11 I don't know when says Aristotle is all okay all of Aristotle we can accept in Christianity and then after the uh, then sometime after the third crusade all these books surface in Christendom I, they might have come up through Spain that were written by Aristotle um, and that challenged some of the fundamental dogmas of that current Christianity they had done it in Islam before and Islam had had a whole sequence of wonderful wonderful scholars who had been trying to reconcile uh, the Islamic faith with Aristotle and then the Christians do it under Aquinas and it changes the religion and kind of opens the door to the major heresies of the 13th and 14th and 15th and then the 16th centuries um, and that happens in universities it happens in universities because there's only a limited number of books and they suddenly get an awful lot more books and then they've got to try and work out lecture notes to explain it to it to people who've come who are never going to read the books and it kind of then gets all trying it's whispered out uh, and becomes totally uncontrollable um, but that was back in the day when universities mattered. Which was probably what a question. What I can't remember. Well, it was one of my questions at some point. Yeah. But you come back. You come back to voice. Yes. And that that made that made sense to me. But look, I think we should should play some music. Okay. This is, this is Follow FM. Okay. And it's essentially a music channel. Yeah. I never got that email. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they have tried to inform you <laughs> of what what your show should be about. But you, you. To be fair, when when you were doing this this show, you did pause for for a music. Track. I did. I did always pause for music. It gave me a chance to work out what I was going to say next. Yes. Well, look, I'm going to play one one track now, and when when we come back, I would like you to go com more a bit more into fiction. I think everything we've said so far could be backed up by fact, if anybody's <laughs> queried any of it, uh, or we will add some facts in later on an edit. Okay. Uh, but. In the remaining uh, half an hour or so, we'd you like, we'd do you want me to story tell? We'd like a story, please. Okay, I can story tell. I so sort of have to work out what I'm doing to do. You will have to. Work, you've got about four minutes. Okay. <laughs> 